We are particularly honored and privileged tonight to have as our keynote speaker, former Staff Sergeant, United States Army, and New Hampshire resident, Ryan Pitts, who received the Congressional Medal of Honor for risking his life while serving as a forward observer during combat operations in Afghanistan, July 13, 2008. Created in 1861, the Medal of Honor is the United States of America's highest military honor, awarded for personal acts of valor above and beyond the call of duty. The medal is awarded by the President of the United States in the name of the United States Congress. Ryan was presented with the Medal of Honor by President Obama. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a true American hero, Ryan Pitts. Thank you. Thank you. Before I get started, I, gotta, I do have to answer the mayor's call. I was one of those people that stood up. Nobody came and saw me, so I'll be looking for you after I'm done up here, after dinner. Uh, I, I really want to thank, I mean, it, thank you everyone for being here tonight. It, it's an honor for me to be here to help support uh, the New England Center and everything they do for our veterans. It's truly amazing. Um, I look at this, so, well, it's, it's gone now. Okay, the leave no one behind. In my opinion, that is the most sacred creed, phrase. It transcends every branch of service, every generation, doesn't matter. That is our most sacred duty to each other as service members, is to leave no one behind. Learning that has been a journey. It was a journey. I joined the military as an individual, as this 170 pounds soaking wet 17 year old kid, never played a team sport, at least not one that I was good at, and then joined the military and ended up in combat one day. And we had talked about leaving no one behind. I mean, it was written, but there wasn't any sort of you know, formal creed that we recited all the time. And the first time that I really saw it in action was in July of 2005. This was my first deployment. I was 20, 19 at the time. Our unit was in south, uh, southwestern Afghanistan. We were actually at Kandahar Airfield, and we were the QRF for the southern half of Afghanistan. Our unit's job was that if there was another unit that had a loss of life or was in a fight that they were vastly outnumbered, our job was to, to load up on helicopters and fly out. And on the morning of July 25th, a special forces unit had gotten in you know, contact with a large enemy force in our, our unit. We were spun up. And so we flew out and, and we had a feeling that it was gonna be a bad day when we could look out the back of the helicopter and see them dropping bombs to, to clear the LZ so we could come in and land. And we hit the ground, we link up with the unit that's there and have the orders to go through and, and clear this village and, and we start going through systematically and we have our platoon there. And uh, we come across this one hut halfway through, we get engaged by the enemy. Uh, hard to tell where they're at. You know, there's buildings all over the place, trees, and uh, there's this doorway that goes down underground and our platoon leader says, hey, you know, who's cleared this? Anybody cleared this? Nobody, nobody cleared it. And so he starts to ask for volunteers, you know, who's got a, a flashlight on their weapon? We didn't know our flashlights at the time. He's like, all right, fine, I'm going to go down there. Well, the squad leader, Staff Sergeant Michael Schaefer, grabs him by the back of his body armor and says, hey, you know, hey, sir, you're the platoon leader, you're the lieutenant, you know, take a back seat. I got this. And he stacks up in the door with one of his team leaders, sergeant, and uh, Star Schaefer goes down into this room to, to clear it. And as he enters that room, he's engaged by some enemy fighters in there that are, that are hiding. And he's immediately struck. And the other sergeant behind him is pushed back. He has to, to exit the stairs because of the volume of fire. He comes up and everybody starts yelling, you know, where's Schaefer, where's Schaefer? We gotta go down and get Schaefer. And so this guy, Sergeant Haas, steps right up, Eric Haas. He says, I'll go down. He has his machine gun with the, with a flashlight on it. He goes down the stairs and he comes around the corner 
And as he's going down to get Simon Schaefer, he's shot in the hand and in the knee. And he drags himself up. This time, we're not giving up. Simon Schaefer's down there, and he's one of our own. We're going to go get him. And we throw a smoke grenade down there to obscure our movement down there and try and smoke out the enemy. And despite the fact that Sergeant Schaefer's been wounded, Sergeant Haas was wounded trying to go and get him, guys were lining up to volunteer to run into that room filled with smoke to try and get Sergeant Schaefer out. And they did. They went down one after another to get him up these stairs and get him out of that room. Suffering smoke inhalation. Unfortunately, we lost Sergeant Schaefer that day. He was killed and he was still in the room. But there was at least a dozen men, half dozen men, that lined up to go down in that room to get him out of there, regardless of his condition. And they stayed out there. They didn't call it quits at that point. There were guys throwing up water. They could barely breathe down in the smoke inhalation. And there was the option to get on a medevac helicopter, and they chose to stay. That was, I had never seen anything like that before. And to that point, and for a long time, that was the worst fight I had ever been in. And that was one of the only times that I had ever seen American soldiers have to go back and, and get someone. And it, it always stuck with me. And it, it stuck with me, especially when we came back from that deployment. And at that time in the Army, they had come out with this warrior ethos, the soldier's creed, that we'd get up and recite every morning. And it would say things like, I will always place the mission first. I will never accept defeat. I will never quit. I will never lose fallen comrades. And I remember at the time that I thought that this was really, in my mind, foolish. That, you know, a creed, these words of making these privates or anybody stand up and say these words isn't necessarily going to make them act. Right? If somebody's never going to go get someone, or if they're, gonna, if they're a quitter, saying I'm never going to quit is never going to change that. But as is the, the way it goes in the military, compliance is the name of the game. And I complied and learned that creed and recited it with everything I had every morning. For about a year until we deployed on my, my second deployment in 2008, 2007, 2008. And it was on that deployment that I was on the receiving end of not being left behind. In July 2008, about three weeks from going home, our unit was tasked with going out and setting up security to build a new base. This wasn't uncommon. We had done it on my, my previous deployment, um, but you know, we're close to going home, so we weren't exactly excited about it. We had been on the ground for about five days. We knew that there was the possibility. We thought the attack, the ant attack, was imminent. There had been a lot of enemy activity in that area over the, the previous year. They had tried to overrun one of our bases. We just thought, where well, we were breaking down some bases in the north, it's logical. They're going to come down the valley and try and, uh, try and attack us. And on the morning, uh, the, the fifth day, that happened, July 13, 2008. And I, I remember it very clearly. The morning started out, the fight started out with a burst of machine gun fire from the north, and then all hell broke loose. It was, it was like a thunderstorm of fire. There were bullets raining down like raindrops. You know, RPGs and hand grenades kept coming in at our position. Right off the bat, I'm wounded at my position. We were at an observation post a little bit outside where we had set up in the center of this village where majority of our forces were in the center of the village. I was a little bit outside of this observation post, about 100, 150 yards away. And right off the bat, I'm wounded. Several other guys are wounded. There's only nine of us there. And these guys just jumped right into action. I mean, these were all, most of these soldiers, it was their first deployment. And they never needed to be told what to do. And there were just some incredible actions. And one of them was, one of the guys up there was this guy, Jonathan Ayers. And he was just a very interesting individual. He was just very dry. Um, you know, he'd kind of be like somebody reading you instructions on how to make a peanut butter sandwich. <laughs> but his actions that day were remarkable. He was tasked with, 
uh, manning a machine gun that faced to the east. And he was our eastern flank. And he was taking a huge volume of fire because the enemy was focusing on all our heavy, heavy weapon systems, and he was on one of them. And in the course of doing his job, he took a direct hit to his helmet and knocked him over. Now, I mean, at that point, any sane person would say, you know, that, that's enough, you know. One, th there's going to be another one. Uh, not Jonathan Ayers. He knew that we needed it. He knew that he had a job to do. And so he got back up on that gun and continued to fire. There were other guys like Stuart Rainey who ran around moving ammo and managing the battle while me and the other senior leader up there were wounded. This guy like Jason Bogar who stood up and returned fire on the enemy and he put a tourniquet on my leg, saving my life. Things went on like this for a while. Everybody was fighting with everybody, everything they had, fighting wounded. Meanwhile, down at the vehicle patrol base, they're in the fight too. It's not any easier for anybody in any other position. Our platoon leader, Lieutenant Brostrom, we had a company commander on the ground. Lieutenant Brostrom said, hey, sir, you know, I, I got to get up there. We, we had taken casualties. We had taken you know, two casualties within the opening moments of the battle up there. He killed in action. And Lieutenant Brostrom was not going to leave us alone up there. He knew we needed help. So he ran to another position, asked for volunteers, and he picked up Corporal Jason Hovater. And Again, all these guys, they're special, like all in their own way. Hovater was this incredible guy. He was like this little miniature Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was built like him, I swear. And he could do the accent and everything. He was our platoon comedian. Just unbelievable. Uh, small town kid from Tennessee, very you know, devout family. I always remember, though, that he talked about being afraid, which to me, that was a huge deal. I mean, we're in this infantry platoon of paratroopers, red-blooded Americans, that, that seemed sort of contradictory, that he would openly talk about being afraid, but I've been in, there's other guys that have been in fights with him, that have been in battles, that when this, he was getting shot at, this kid was right there hanging with everybody else. And on that day, I'm sure he was afraid. I know that he felt fear, because he talked about it all the time. He was afraid of, of dying. He was afraid of letting us down. But that didn't stop him from doing his duty. So he linked up with Lieutenant Brostrom, and they made a run 100, 150 meters over open ground to come reinforce our observation post. And I, uh, I had never been so relieved in my life after the initial fear of I'm sitting there wounded, and Lieutenant Brostrom pops his head up over the sandbags like one of those whack-a-moles and asks what's going on. And I couldn't believe that they had made it, that somebody else was there. But they came for us. They did. There was no guarantee that they were going to make it. They did it. And I'm relieved because I'm wounded, the other leader's wounded, Lieutenant Brostrom can take charge, and he does. And there's more people, more bodies up there. And this is, this is a fight that we could tell from the beginning that there's a chance that maybe none of us go home. Fight goes on for a little while longer. And probably about an hour in is when I start to realize there's not a lot of fire coming out of the observation post where I'm at. I can hear fire coming in, but it doesn't sound like there's any of our guys moving around. And... I didn't want to yell out because I didn't want to let the enemy know that I was alone, I was wounded. I didn't feel like I could leave. And at that point, I crawled around and discovered that everybody that had been up there had either been killed or, or had to fall back. I, that was the most terrifying moment of my life, being alone, knowing that I can't leave. And I called over the radio. And I called down to the, the main patrol base and told them, and I said, hey, I'm alone. Everybody up here is either dead or had to fall back. You either send more people or this position will fall. And our company commander, Matt Meyer, had a very difficult decision to make. The mission and everyone's lives is greater than any one man. And at the time, he, he, he didn't think he had anybody to send. He told me, hey, I can't send anybody. I don't blame him for it. That was the right decision. That's the burden of command. 
but there was another guy, and everybody, everybody down at the vehicle patrol base could hear, hear the call. Actually, every other position could hear the call. And this one specialist, Jacob Stones, one of the most junior guys out there, heard it and immediately jumped up and said, I'm going up there. We got to go get Sarm Pitts. He probably used a whole bunch of other four letters, colorful words that aren't appropriate for this setting. But he said, I'm going. And his team leader, Israel Garcia, said, all right, you know, go by yourself. He linked up with them. They moved to another position, linked up with another two guys, Sergeant Sean Samaru and Mike Denton. I had no idea they were coming. I'm just sitting there bleeding, waiting for the end. And these guys showed up. They knew that all these other guys had been killed up at the observation post and that the same thing might happen to, the, to them, but they came. Jacob Stones, Israel Garcia, Mike Denton, and Sean Samaru. They saved my life. They didn't leave me behind. They knew the cost. Unfortunately, there was another round of RPGs that came in after they showed up and all of them were wounded. Israel Garcia was mortally wounded. He traded his life for mine. They lived, leaves no one behind. I carried that with me every day. That I'm here because others didn't leave me behind. And it's not just them. There was Hovader and Brodson. All the guys that we didn't bring home are the reason that I'm here and everybody else is here. Jonathan Ayers, Sergio Abad, Jason Bogar, Jonathan Brodson, Israel Garcia, Jason Hovader, Matthew Phillips, Pruitt Rainey, and Gunnar Zwell. They gave their lives so that the rest of us could come home. Coming home can be hard. I've seen it with my friends and I, I've looked back and I, I think you can see it in some of the other, other generations that sometimes you come back but you don't come home. You, you do leave a part of yourself over there. What's special about being in the service is everybody lives with that creed I was talking about, that warrior ethos, that I'll never leave a fallen comrade. And I'm almost, I almost feel foolish saying that at the time that I thought that that creed was stupid because I look back on it now and it's not so much that that creed's gonna instill those values in people as it is that it tells them what this organization and these people value. That if you wanna be a part of it, that's what you have to live. And that's what the New England Center is doing. They are living that, leave no one behind. I mean, this is incredible to, to see tonight, you know, 44% reduction in homelessness in Boston. That's unbelievable. That's what's hard too about coming home. I talk about that, right? That creed in the military that everybody lives it is you live in an organization where no matter where you are, these people aren't gonna leave you behind. But what could be hard is coming home and you feel like you're out there on your own. You feel like you're just another number out there where you are part of this close-knit family. And that's what kind of makes it hard to leave. It's not always necessarily what you saw. It's how great it was and then losing it. And so it's equally as important here. I think it's easy to lose that we can't leave people behind They've given a part of themselves so that we can enjoy the lives we have here. And that's special. And we have debts. I, I feel it as an American. This country owes me nothing. We are so privileged to be here. It is such a special place, all the freedoms that we're afforded, that it's about giving back and it's about being a part of that team and making sure that we leave no one behind. I want to thank the New England Center for everything they do, Andy McCauley, everybody behind the scenes, because just like on that day with me, that day was carried by all the people that never got, that, that haven't, haven't been recognized. 
right? There's all the people in Boston, all of you, that people don't know will hear your names that have contributed, but you're helping make sure that we leave no one behind. So I want to thank everyone here tonight for being a part of this, for supporting the New England Center, for supporting making a difference for veterans and their challenges with transition. Thank you for everything that you've done.